Hello there, intrepid dungeon delvers. Are you sick and tired of the cesspool of idiots swarming in your Wonder Home normal mode runs? Perhaps you encounter people who simply will not listen to your almighty reason and logic. Or maybe you can't tell that guild member that they suck at following instructions because they'll be offended. Never fear, this comprehensive guide to Wonder Home Normal Mode was tailored to the type of people who simply cannot fathom how to make use of their basic motor skills and functions when it involves teaming up with other people. I can guarantee an increase of at least 60% success if you and your less intelligent counterparts watch this video. So let's get started immediately, shall we? As a short precursor, allow me to describe Wonder Home Normal Mode. This is one of the four new dungeons that was released in the Dungeon Assault patch of North American Terra. Do you enjoy fighting in stop motion, constantly freezing as your graphics car begs for mercy? Do you like sick fever dreams that make you feel as if you drank one too many alcoholic beverages last night? Perhaps you have a thing for clowns or giant caterpillar mages named Bandersnatch with rectums full of teeth. If you answered yes, then keep on listening because that is Wonder Home Normal Mode mode in a nutshell. To begin with, when you first enter the dungeon, you'll notice how beautiful and stunning it is upon entry, as if you were to step in into an entirely different new world. Did you get all that? Take in all those sexy, lustrous textures. Good. Now turn your graphics down so the entire thing looks like it was just excreted from a fat Kumas's butt. Get used to this for at least the first 20 minutes of the dungeon, as you'll be facing some of the most overkill amount of enemy spawns. Before you reach the first boss, you will encounter two mini bosses that are relatively easy to handle, one being a giant gula chef who simply loves to belly flop on your team, and the other being a monster I can't even begin to place an archetype on, so we'll just call him the scythe holder thingy. The scythe holder thingy mini boss is first, and will summon a metric ass ton of little monsters that will likely render your most powerful graphics cards to a screeching death. Unfortunately, such was the case for the first mini boss in my graphics card. But on the bright side, he isn't anything to write home about. The second boss is a giant gula chef who uses his rolls of fat and his signature belly flop to splatter your party all over the floor. You should all relatively dispose of him with ease. Just. Don't mind not being able to see half the room due to his size. Congratulations! If you cleared these two mini-bosses with relatively low deaths, then you're well on your way to bringing the fight to the Bandersnatch. Also, your success rate should increase by 5%. So, you've reached this open room with a gate in the middle, separating you from the boss. Much like the first mini-boss, this boss is somewhat of an older brother and will throw constant spawning ads from each of the four pillars in the room until you disable his spawner which lies beyond the gate. You will see at least several or more evil mages hurling deathly orange balls in your face in an attempt to suffocate the life out of you upon entering the room. Hold on there, Tiger. I know you want to begin stabbing and murdering, but this fight actually requires a semi-functioning plan that was hopefully spawned from one of your more brighter members. Or you. As you might have already become well aware, the room you entered is littered with constantly spawning enemies from each of the four pillars. After a short period of time in killing enemies, a gate will open near the entrance leading up to the flight of stairs. This is where you split your group into two parties of five, bonus points if you already assigned them before you entered the fight. Leave behind five individuals you absolutely despise and do not care about as you let the angry hordes of monsters devour them and take your tank, a healer, and three of your most intelligent damage dealers up the staircase. After fighting your way through the corridor of vicious enemies, you reach the other side of the room. If the other team isn't dead and screaming explicitives due to their natural incompetence, ask them if all the monsters on the other side are dead. If the enemies are dead, quickly destroy the whetstone to the left as you come down the staircase to initiate the boss fight and allow the gate between you and your other members to fall. As I said, this boss fight will greatly resemble the first mini-boss. His name is Lutwidge. You could say Lutwidge is the older brother of the mini-boss that you killed, and after a short period of mourning, he's come to carve your assets with his scythe and mount them on his wall. Ew, that's actually really gross. Uh, but on that off note, Ludwig hits pretty freaking hard if you're careless, so don't get in front of him, and he also likes to instill random intervals of fear in your group, causing your entire party to run around wildly like headless chickens. Good luck! If you're not eating the burgundy-colored carpet yet, then great job on beating Ludwig! You've now reached the end of the dungeon. <laughs> uh, just screwing with you. Turn yourself around in a 180 degree angle and head back to that staircase you bypassed on the right. There'll be a shortcut to the floor below you that the Bandersnatch created a hole to. Why not just jump down the hole, you ask? <laughs> Great question. The reason you can't jump down that hole is, after heading down the stairs, you'll begin working your way through the disgusting feces-filled sewage of Wonderhome. There'll be three mini-bosses that will most likely irritate you and fill you with despair when you realize their mechanics are meant to test the mental capacity of your party. So I'll just do some quick-fire advice for each of them. 
One of them is an evil-looking ghostie that summons an enormous AoE ring made of fire to the first person to engage it. Contrary to popular belief, staying in the fire does not give you any beneficial effects, so get the hell out of it. Another mini-boss is kinda a floating mermaid of sorts, likes to spawn multiple copies of herself a lot. Like, a lot. So instead of focus firing the one you know is a real copy, just murder the hell out of all of them with AoEs and explosions. The last mini boss is a boring priest who summons pylons that shoot lasers. Just throw more explosions and AoEs, you should be fine. After clearing the bottom floor, pull the lever and it will activate the most dreaded part of this dungeon. Platforming. That's right, remember that thing I said about basic motor skills? Yeah, if some of your party members don't have this attribute, feel free to go AFK at the end of the jumping segment and get a drink. Or maybe let that poop you've been holding for the past 30 minutes out in the toilet. Too much information? <laughs> oh man, you should have seen the size of that. Congratulations on overcoming the hardest part of the dungeon. Welcome now to the next set of bosses. That's right, you get two bosses this time, not one. Aren't the developers just such generous human beings? And better yet, you have to split your group again. But first, clear the entire room by pulling all the monsters rather than taking your time and getting one half of the room than the next. Your party will surely thank you for bringing them a horde of monsters they most likely can't contain. After clearing the room any which way you want, you will then split your group into two sets of five. Ideally, you want a healer, a tank of some form in each of the groups, and and three DPS in each of the groups. After you've argued and screamed at each other on who gets to take what, take your positions and prepare to pull the lever at the same time to allow both parties to enter the rings at the same time as well. Unfortunately, thanks to your party member's murderous instincts, it's very likely that they'll dump all their longest cooldowns on a boss they can't even hurt until the gate rises again. Remember that, you can't hurt the boss until the gate rises again. Wonderful. Be sure to communicate with your party as you progress through the fight as you must kill each of these bosses within 30 seconds from each other. Not too difficult. Until you realize that all of your damage dealers will most likely ignore the most important rule for this fight. Exercising restraint when doing damage. <gasps> oh no! Did you get that? Let me say it again. Exercise restraint when doing damage. That's right, it's not a race to kill the boss. The ego and size of your crits won't do a damn thing if you have to restart the fight all over again. <clears throat> oh wow, uh, sorry about that, bit of repressed feelings there. All under control. After clearing the two bosses with minimal casualties, you can safely add 15% success to your chances as most groups are usually too stupid to comprehend the fundamentals of killing in a synchronized fashion. Guess what? More platforming! But before we do that, we have to clear the seedy underbelly of the sewers, so get down there and start killing all those creepy snakes and one clown along with those undead things. After you've done that, there will be several switches to pull to activate the platforms. Now then, this segment is significantly harder than the first platforming segment, so put your big boy pants on and get ready for... MOVING PLATFORMS! That's right, these platforms actually move. God help your soul. After spending an hour and a half failing at moving platforms, you'll eventually encounter this giant pylon. It'll be surrounded by clowns that you can easily dispose of, so just sit there, soak the damage those lasers are shoving down your throat, and beat the hell out of that pylon to open the gate. Just hope your healers don't get too mad that you're not making a conscious effort to get out of the way of the lasers. After going through all those minor annoyances, allow me to congratulate you and your party for reaching what I would like to call the halfway point of this dungeon. To still be together and succeeding in killing bosses without disbanding? Truly, that is a noteworthy effort and must be praised. Now let's get down to business. As you can see in the center of the room, there is a brightly colored clown. A very large clown. You might recognize him as a cyclops from the Crucible of Flame. Unfortunately, all the abuse and beatings that were rendered onto his perfect beautiful body, which he was quite proud of, caused him to undergo several months of physical and psychological therapy. After being told that people were beating him because it was a game to accumulate points for a fancy scoreboard, he immediately went off the deep end and became a clown, calling himself One-Eyed Jack and seeking employment in Wonder Home, where he tends to the ball ring thinking of life as a mere game. Thus creating this boss fight. As you most likely already know, One-Eyed Jack follows and resembles the Cyclops archetype. 
In other words, he shoots freaking lasers from his single eye, loves to grab random beach balls out of his butt, and slam them on you, and most importantly, he'll run around like a deranged madman toward the front of the room and begin to mutter ominous words such as, Rollin', rollin'. When you see him say this, start screaming at your other party members to form a line and begin attacking the rolling balls that come out of the tubes toward you. Great job! If you succeeded, then you'll get amazing buffs to your attack and also won't be swarmed by clown car amounts of monsters. He'll do this roughly around three times throughout the fight, with each time he does it, he'll send multiple successions of balls to try and slaughter you all. Because you'd require the reaction time of God to destroy all these, it's safe to assume by the second or third time there will be extra monsters to come and slaughter you. If you aren't kissing the tile by the end of this fight, congratulations! You just murdered someone with a deep identity crisis. You should feel bad. Like, really bad. After cleaning up the crime scene and moving on with your life, you come immediately to the next boss after a short excursion. Kill the two little monsters guarding the gate and be sure to loot the potions that they drop. If you haven't noticed yet, there's an NPC in the room who will explain what the boss fight entails, but being the brilliant souls that you all are, you're all going to probably ignore him. So let me give you the digested version of this boss fight. If you like cage fights that resemble the wrestling matches on television, then you'll love this boss. In the middle of the room is a cage with a terolith. Only two of your most badass damage dealers can enter there, and they must have the potions that drop from the monsters that stood guard at the gate. So make sure you give those to them, otherwise it will be stun city for them inside the cage if they do not drink the potion. Meanwhile, all eight of your other members will take a siege tank in a surrounding circle around the cage and begin to rain hell upon the hordes of monsters that wish to get in on the action and protect the finicky cut and paste sorry excuse for a terolith. Unfortunately, this means giving some of your less adequate party members the clearance to command a tank, so be sure to explain the complex nature of this vehicle, such as using the WASD keys on the keyboard to move, and the left mouse button to shoot wherever the orange target reticule is. Hopefully, if things go well, they'll be shooting the enemies and not straddling the wall with their tank like an idiot. After the Terralith breaches a certain percentage of HP, you can then bomb the hell out of him with your tanks, thus creating the illusion of a true rigged wrestling match, much like the ones on television. <laughs> Funny how things like that come to be. After you clear this boss, you are well on your way to the final fight with the Bandersnatch. Unfortunately, you must now clear one of the hardest encounters in Wonderhome. As you can see, there are multiple pylons that shoot lasers. These pylons can be destroyed as you work your way to the center to destroy the giant middle pillar that you need to break. Be very careful when approaching this pillar. Communicate with your part. Or you could just leash the thing. Are, are you freaking serious? How the f- After breaking the game's mechanics and exploiting glitches, you finally reach your end destination. The Bandersnatch. For the purposes of looking extremely epic and to take in the Bandersnatch's beautiful, sexy, glorious form, I will be showing footage without the UI for a good 90% of the fight because I'm just that awesome, and I think we need to take a less cluttered view of the boss. As you can see, the Bandersnatch is a caterpillar mage with a vendetta to destroy all life on the planet. It is imperative that you inspire your party before engaging the Bandersnatch, for just being in his glorious presence decreases your chance of success by 20%. The Bandersnatch is safest when engaged from his sides, rather than staying at the front or toward his butt filled with teeth. His normal moves consist of slamming his giant staff in a frontal cone, doing yoga while eating the floor and defecating all over your party with a large AoE circle all around him, farting on you, puking on you and turning you to stone, performing roundhouse tail smacks, giant belly flopping body slams, slip and slide attacks, and lastly, injecting large amounts of alcohol into your body and making you inebriated. <sighs> Did you get all that? Take the time to study these moves if you want, otherwise move on to the next segment, his special attacks. The special mechanics for the Bandersnatch are quite many. The first is a small one where he summons a blue and yellow colored ring around you. This is a far more dangerous AoE as those who get stuck in it will be slowed to an immense crawl, leaving them helpless to the Bandersnatch's almighty visage. The next more annoying mechanic is the I'm gonna curl up and put you to sleep while I annihilate all of you move. If your healers are semi-competent, then the idiot who got stuck in the sleep will be easily saved as you can cleanse off the sleep. But that's not all. Following after the sleep, the Bandersnatch 
Snatch begins his super epic spell in which he will annihilate you with an instant kill if you do not find the green circle of protection he so graciously provided. If you manage to reach the circle, and some of your party members have not, take the time to single them out and laugh at their misfortune before continuing the fight. The next special mechanic he does is when he says, You can't run from me. In this one, you'll attempt to try and knock down the banner snatch before he chains your entire party to him and lets loose his obnoxiously large spill of... Uh, we'll just call it copious amounts of indescribable leakage. If you are successful in knocking him down, you cancel out his bathroom break and render him helpless for a few seconds. Good job, I'm sure his bladder is just screaming right now. The last and most likely hardest mechanic in this fight is the color phase. This will happen following one of the banner snatch's sleep curls. You will get a set of four debuffs ranging from four basic colors, red, green, blue, and yellow. You must go to each of these colored pylons in order of your debuffs. If it makes you feel any better, attack the pylon in a desperate fashion, otherwise just stand there like a sane human being until your debuff wears off, and then you can move on to the next one. Why is this hard, you ask? Because we're going to assume that your party members don't know their basic colors and will most likely ask the difference between their reds and yellows. Oh, and if you're colorblind, um, good luck! If you followed all these helpful and insightful tips and advice, then you should have a dead caterpillar bandersnatch after hours of grueling effort. Congratulations! You've just completed Wonder Home Normal Mode. Now go take all of your sexy, beautiful loot, and be sure to not read the class-specific text on the certain buy and pick up plate and leather armors to piss off all the members of your party. Have fun! Hey, my name is Elithis, and I'd like to extend my thanks on watching this rather condensed and slightly snarky guide to Wonder Home Normal Mode. I'd like to impart one last piece of advice I find to be very important. You might find it contradictory to the entirety of this video, but just have fun with the dungeon and don't give people a hard time. Stressing folks out and letting tensions run high isn't the way to do this dungeon. It's fun, alright? Line up a bit. You're fighting a damn caterpillar with a butt full of teeth and also a clown who loves to throw beach balls at you. The least you can do is exercise patience for those who are new to the dungeon. And if you are new to the dungeon, make sure you do your homework. You'll be a lot better off and everyone will be a lot more happier and moving on their way. Oh, and seriously, read the text on the bind and pick up armors. Some of them are class specific. Anyways, stick around for the bloopers if you'd like. Thanks for watching. Hello there, intrepid dungeon delvers! Are you sick and tired of those cesspep? <sighs> oh god, I just started. Do you like. <laughs> but, on the bright side, he isn't anything to try. <laughs> After you've done that. <laughs> the next more. Mon the next more. Mon the next more annoying mechanic is the I'm gonna curl up and put you to sleep while annihilating all of you move. If your healers are semi-competent, then the idiots who got stuck in the sleep will be easily saved as you can cleanse off the sleep. But that's not all. Following after the sleep, the bandersnatch begins to super... Oh, and seriously, read the text on the bind and pick up stuff. Some of them are class-specific. Anyways, stick around for the build. Wow, that's gonna be there.